really thinking about and understanding your network and your network will actually reveal a lot more opportunities than 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 most people think it will business of architecture episode 332 hello and welcome back architect nation i'm enix sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips strategies and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the business of architecture step-by-step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you want to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today I speak with Eben Falconer, Eben Falconer is the former business development director of the Americas for BIG, Bjarke Ingels Group. Eben joined BIG's New York City office in 2010. During her tenure there, the New York City office grew from 13 to 200 employees and greatly expanded its market reach, winning its first North American cultural and institutional projects. In addition to being involved with the company's business development strategy and leading its implementation, she was also a member of its executive management team. And prior to joining BIG, Eben worked for Stephen Hole Architects, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Urban Land Institute. More recently, she was a director at Gale, and before that, the director of strategic initiatives at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. I'm super excited to have Eben on with us today to talk about Big's explosive growth during its early years in the United States. And as we record this episode, we're four months into the COVID-19 pandemic. So this conversation is especially crucial as you look for strategies to maintain and gain new clients and projects during difficult times. Even welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great to have you. I, I'm just curious, how did you get started in business development? It's a nuanced field. Can you shed some light on that for us to give us an introduction to your background? Yeah, of course. It's it's funny because sometimes people ask me, oh, you know, where do we find people who do business development for architecture? You know, um, what kind of background should we be looking for? And I have never met anyone who has some sort of straightforward path to it. You know, it's not, I always tell people, it's not like there's a degree program that we all go do and a certification and then, and then we we appear in the in the industry um so my personal story is i um i'm trained as an architectural historian but i'm a historian by training and not by practice so i i studied uh, i did a master's in architecture history at yale and um i was always interested in contemporary professional culture so I somehow managed to write a 300 page thesis where I didn't write about a single building. Uh, I, I wrote about, I wrote about architects and, and the way that they spoke about their work. And specifically I wrote about Danish architects. Um, so for me, when I finished school, I had this, um, I was one of those lucky 2009 graduates who finished into a very challenging economy. I had a job. I had a, I had a summer internship at the museum of modern art I was very excited about that. I, I knew at that point that I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an academic. I, if I was going to do a PhD, I wanted to take a little time before I did that. So I, I thought maybe I would explore curatorial work. I worked at the museum. It was wonderful. I uh, got to work on a lot of interesting installations, but that museum was also in a hiring freeze, you know, couldn't, couldn't stay there. Um, and before I had gone to grad school, I had worked for a wonderful firm in Seattle called Weinstein Architects and Urban Designers. And I had the... Um, I was fortunate to work with really thoughtful leadership there who, um, who were giving me exposure to architecture quite broadly. And I was working uh, in part on, uh, with their marketing team. So I'd gotten a sense a little bit of how, of how architectural marketing worked. Um, so when I finished, I, or when I, when I finished the internship and I was thinking about what, what was going to come next, I, I thought like, well, I know how to do this. I know how to write. I like working with architects. Um, let me see if there's some roles here in New York that would allow me to stay here and, and make a living doing something that I think is interesting, but I don't know, I wouldn't say I knew a ton about it. Uh, and I got a, I got the job as the director of marketing business development at Stephen Hall's office um, and realized through working there that I loved the work. I loved 
thinking strategically about um, where we wanted to be, what kind of work we wanted to pursue, what types of clients would be interested in us, how to team, particularly pursuing uh, international and global work, uh, and doing that with obviously a really incredible portfolio of projects. Um, and that was that was that was a wonderful um, exposure to what I. Um, what you can do when you have this sort of this deep bench of work. Um, I realized at a certain point that I was interested in working with a broader portfolio of projects, or at least pursuing a broader portfolio. I and mean, Stephen does incredible work in the art museums and, and university work. Uh, and I was interested in, in how you would pursue work with more work with developers, more different types of projects. So um, I was thinking about leaving and I knew uh, I had known Bjarke, I'd met him a couple of years before, and I knew one of the other partners who also happened to have worked at that same firm in Seattle. And I'd heard that they were starting, that they were thinking about uh, 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 coming to New York. And so I reached out and I, uh, to Kai Bergman, who's the partner in charge of business development there. And I got an email from Bjarke about two hours later saying, I think we should talk. Uh, so that was August, 2010. Um, at that point, they were about a month away from opening the New York office, and uh, and then I, I joined in, um, in November. Um, so they had been there for for two months. Thirteen people, small small scrappy office in a startup space, uh, and uh, and I started doing business development there, and that was incredible for me. That's just that opportunity to do uh, to do that really entrepreneurial work um, uh, was sort of blasted my career off, which was incredible. And when you say you started doing business development, help me understand, what were the tasks? What were you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? So in the beginning, you know, in the beginning at Big, it was really uh, introducing us to people. Uh, because at the time, this might seem hard to imagine now, but at the time, people didn't know who we were. Um, architecture students knew us. Which, was, which meant we had no trouble recruiting interns. Um, and we always had a really wonderful group of, of young people in the office, but clients didn't know who we were and consultants didn't know who we were, at least not in the US at this point. We, Big was, was, um, was pretty was well known in, in certain types of fields in, um, in Europe at the time, but not, not in the US, not in North America. So really for the first two years, a lot of what I was doing was extensive amounts of outreach. Uh, Bjarke had moved to New York at that time. Uh, so uh, he and I were doing a lot of meetings. Kai Berkman was still living in Copenhagen at the time, but he would come every month or two. And then he and I would just do intense rounds of meetings. Whoever would meet with us, we would meet with them. So, uh, and that wasn't just potential clients. Also, it was it really was getting to know the consultant network um, because we uh, at the time, Big had landed with the with the Via project, the Durst organization, which opened a lot of doors for us because the Durst are known for doing high quality buildings and 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 for doing really you know really thoughtful work. So it wasn't like we were coming in with some client that nobody had heard of. We were coming in with you know quite a stamp of approval from them, which was which was an incredible gift, frankly. To, uh, the building that we had designed, no one thought it was going to be built like that. So when it finally was built, you know, five years later, you can say like, see, I told you it would, I told you it would look like that. Like we weren't, it's unusual, but we weren't kidding when, when we were going to do something like that on the New York skyline. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, very much about um, researching who, who we should know, uh, who would be interested in working with us and then doing everything we could to get, to get in front of them. What was what was your procedure for researching coming in uh, with a blank slate like that? Tell me tell me about that process. Yeah, so in, again, so this is 2010, so there was a lot of uncertainty still in the market. New York was coming out of it, but slowly. The rest of the country was kind of coming out of it, also at a slower pace and a bit and a bit bumpier. Um, so it was really understanding kind of who. You know, on the developer side, for example, who who might have an appetite for for the type of work that we do, based on you know, who, who what architects they've engaged in the past. Um, it was also about you know really understanding what our what our network was, um, and and Big had some network over here, but a little you know sometimes it's a little bit random. Like you know when you're not in a country, who who your who your relationships are can be a little bit. Um, 
like, oh, I know this person from grad school. But so I was really trying to trying to piece that together and understand like who who are the relationships we have, um, and how can we how can we you kind know, of use those to 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 leverage into the types of relationships that we that that we want to have in the future. And then it was also frankly a lot of RFQs and RFPs. Um, uh, partly because that's the way we all know that work comes through, um, but also, frankly, as a tool to introduce ourselves to people. So now when I talk to my clients, I actually tell them to be very thoughtful about the time they spend on RFQs and RFPs, but we were very intentionally pursuing a number of them because we wanted we wanted these types of clients to know who we were, and if we couldn't get in front of them in person, we wanted them to at least see our qualifications and through that kind of formal process. So there's a lot of that. Amazing. Yeah. How did you find your win rate with those RFPs, RFQs? Was was that very successful in terms of actually winning projects, or was it like you say, more of a long term play of getting in front of the right people? It was more of a long term play. It was, um, you know, we tracked our our win rate on those. We tracked them globally, and I could see, you know, we had a we would always have a higher win rate in in the Nordics, for example, because we were more established and better known there. Um, and then you would see it sometimes. Certain times would be, you know. One year we would have very high win rate in, in France, and uh, um, so it, it it varied. But we also made a, a considerable effort over the six years that I was there to actually reduce the number of RFPs and RFQs that we pursued in order to, you know, to go. I think we went from being doing about a hundred a year uh, globally when I started to doing seventy five a year when I left, and of that, I would say in New York we were doing about twenty a year. So it really it really came down in volume um, and with so at the hit rate that stayed the, the same or right. at, Yeah, at the beginning in the, in the New York office, how many were you doing? So we were probably pursuing, so if we're doing 100 globally, you know, these, funny, these, these numbers start to be very far behind us. So if we were doing, so in 2010, if we did 100, maybe, maybe 35, 30, 35 of those would be in, in North or be in the Americas. I mean, and that, that's substantial. I mean, considering that there's 12 months in a year, we're yeah. talking about three RFPs a month. And who was preparing these? Did you have a, you had a team to rely on to help you so put these together? In, in the beginning, no. In the beginning, wow. um, it was it was me, which I, there were days when I felt like I lived in InDesign, like, you know, <laughs> where I feel like I would close my computer for the day and walk home and the the, the street would feel like I was still in, in InDesign, which is not a good yeah, thing. Yeah, you're, you're trying to click the street lamp and make it turn <laughs> yes, to green. And... <laughs> exactly. It's like, what do I link? Yeah. So we, there were some very intense moments. And there was also, you know, like things that, that you, that are absurd, you know, the fact that all of, you know, we, I had a I had a team of um, uh, of colleagues in Copenhagen, of course, and who had produced a lot of the marketing materials already. But of course, everything was in A four, and every everything had British spelling. So I would have to. And my one of my colleagues over there was British, so he and I used to joke about, you know, take the U out, put the U in. And so I was always having to go through and like Americanify the uh, the the text because mm. I just knew there's no way we can make a case for us being local. If they see that we spell a neighborhood with a U, like we're going to get kicked out and run <laughs> immediately. Um, yeah. And also just like super tedious things like turning all the documents from a four to, to eight and a half by 11. I, if I never have to do that again, I will be the happiest woman on the planet. Um, but I, I hired an intern when I, when we hit about 50 in New York. So up until then I was doing, uh, I was doing it all. And had, but of course, with um, the team in Copenhagen, had a, a coordinator who I could tap for help sometimes. Um, but yeah, finally, around fifty, I said, you know, um, this is too much for one person. I, I need, you know, we're not doing all, everything that we can. We're not doing it as well as we can. So I, I hired an intern then, part time, and then very quickly realized we needed a full time intern. So then hired an intern again. Uh, and then by the time we were 200 people, I was managing a team of three. So I had a, I had a business development manager um, uh, and two coordinators or a coordinator and an intern um, uh, as the team uh, at, at 200. So still, frankly, fairly lean, but, um, but bigger than one. Thank God. I, I'm, I'm trying to do the math, and it sounds like your schedule was probably pretty packed. I mean, doing that many, doing three detailed, well-put-together RFPs a month doing outreach, scheduling meetings, responding to emails, going to meetings. Yeah, it was busy. full. <laughs> it full was time? busy. But full it was on? definitely a full-time job. Uh, yep. But also, you know, but also really 
fun. Uh, I mean, those of us who were there in the, in the early days of big, you know, joke a little bit about the old times. So it was, of course, lots of absurd stories of things, you know, like when, remember those, that day when we had no internet and we were like stealing the neighbor's internet and hoping they wouldn't notice and then uploading files really, really slowly. Like, yeah, that was fun. Uh, but it was also, you know, it's a, a wonderful group of people with a lot of energy and no one was working harder, thank, frankly, than the, than the architects. So mm, I, I've always been able to manage my, my own schedule and my time and my team to not be as, um, as intense, but it, it, it always meant very full days for sure. Even I, I know people, people don't work that hard and put themselves all in like that without, without some sort of higher motivating factor, right? Let's face it. There was something, something greater that people were pushing for. What, what, what would you say was the key factor in, in that, having that kind of culture where people were just, it sounds like they were all in, in the mission and the vision of what you guys were doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I would say a lot of it was due to the fact that we believed in the work that I knew that, that any lead I brought home, any project that we were, that we were going to bring in and work on that I knew that the people who were going to work on it were super, super talented and that it was always incredibly exciting for me as a non-designer to bring in an opportunity and then see what the architectural team would transform that into. Like that was, that's always been a motivator for me is, is that I, I believe strongly in the impact that architecture can have in the world uh, and not just architecture, but how we think about our cities, how we design our cities, how we think about the future of living and working and playing uh, and, and to be able to have that impact and bring really, really exciting, thoughtful work um, to where we were. That was, that was the motivator for me. I think I, I, I believe that that was the motivator for the architects as well. I, um, I think the big also benefits from having a very strong office culture. Um, Bjarke is a, is, is a very charismatic leader. Um, I guess that word can have negative connotations, but I just, I meant it. He's, he's fun to be around. Um, and he, you know, what he gets excited about is, is, um, it's infectious. And, uh, and it, it, it made for an office. So we really felt like we were being able to do the most exciting projects and, and, and to see that growth, you know, to go in and see the types of things that we got to do when we were 13 versus the types of things we got to work on when we were 200 was, was enormously satisfying. Amazing. So I, I imagine first day on the job, a new <laughs> office, I imagine maybe there was even some arranging of furniture and, you know, maybe you helping to do that. I know what it's like to work in a startup, I can imagine. So yeah. you're sitting oh, down yeah. at your, your office, uh, maybe even using your own laptop for a little bit while you get the Definitely. right computer in or something. Definitely right, use right. my my own laptop for the first week for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you're sitting there with basically a blank slate. I mean, you're you're not coming in with procedures. You're, you're not coming in. You're you're given, as you said, the the reputation that Big has in the United States as well as the European reputation they have. Uh, so you're you're researching. You're identifying clients, as you said, identifying people who would be a fit for the kind of work that Big wanted to do, and and then you're reaching out to them. Help me understand. What would be the process that you would take in in reaching out? What did you find to be most effective in actually capturing those people's attention, and how did you transition that into a face to face meeting? Yeah, I mean, at the time, in the very beginning, and frankly, also throughout the time, I used to joke that my job was a little bit like the person who steers the cannon, who points the cannon, because Bjarka is incredibly charismatic and fun to, like I said, fun to be around and, um, and he has a good sense of humor. So you could really kind of throw him into any situation with a client and he would land on his feet. Well, which was, is an extraordinary talent. And it was always really fun to watch. Um, so I often felt like my job was to point the cannon say like, okay, this is where I think we should be going. This is who I think you should talk to. And then like, out he goes. Um, so a lot of that, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of sort of saying like, uh, how do we point the cannon? Um, again, also really kind of understanding who is in our network. So very quickly, I think maybe a month after I started, no, no, no. I was actually, it was the week before I started, Bjarka was invited to give a lecture at, um, at the ULI, a ULI gathering in Vancouver. And in the audience was an architect named James Cheng, who is a very, very well-respected uh, Vancouver architect does does a ton of work in the city. I think has also done work up and down the coast and in Hawaii. Um, and he had been doing a lot of work with a firm called West Bank, a development firm there. 
and he heard Bianca speak and he actually said to his client, I think we should be, I think you should talk to him, which is incredible because I usually, I joke with my clients, like you don't get work from other architects, except in this one instance where this generous and thoughtful architect said, I think you, I think my client should meet this other architect. So James had, had introduced Bjarke to, um, to Ian Gillespie, who's uh, the CEO of, of West Bank. And so this, this was happening like as I was there. And so there was this like flurry of send books to Canada. So it was kind of like, who, what? Okay. Like, so we had, we had had, had just published another, um, another monograph. Um, and so I remember just thinking like, we have a lot of material. We want to get this material in people's hands. Um, so there was a lot of that. Like before, I kind of felt like before I even knew who all these people were, it was just kind of like, got to make sure that they have, they've seen our materials, that they have something that we can show. Um, cause the other interesting thing at the time is as, a, as a, you know, in stark contrast to working for Steven, I think when I started big had nine or 10 built projects, um, some of them very, very small. So it was a lot of showing people, um, capabilities without necessarily having a ton of built work. Um, so kind of, it was a lot about talking about potential, frankly, um, and, that's a harder thing to sell, especially when you're new to a market. People want to see like, oh, you want to do this student center? Show me eight other student centers that you've done. But I think there is so much, ex- there's so much exciting material in Big's work, but also really thoughtful ways of telling the story of the project that people really understand it and like lay people understand it. I think that's one challenge that I see with architects now is there's a um, particularly kind of um, in a certain kind of segment of, of the architectural community, there is a lot of talking about their work as if they're always talking to other architects. You know, most people aren't going to know what fenestration is. So can we just never use that word again? That's that'd be one happy request from me. Um, it's not, it's not a corner condition. It's just a corner, right? Like it's not a window condition. It's a window. Like, so I, I really appreciated coming to a place that was very jargon free um, and also always had a very clear story for projects. So it, it meant that lots of people could tell the story of the firm, including me. Uh, I didn't have to be an architect to be able to share what, what made our, our project special. I didn't have to be Bjarke either to share what made our project special. So it wasn't just the the firm principals that were coming in and, and meeting and explaining the potential. Sounds like you were involved in explaining the potential as well. Absolutely. And that was something that was, was I think, is quite unique about BIG and something that I think is um, will be one very interesting legacy from the firm. This firm is still young, of course, so I don't you know to talk about legacy. But I think uh, to to bring in smart, thoughtful people to do business development who may or may not be architects themselves, but to have them be client facing is pretty incredible. And that was because also has a willingness to delegate, which I think is um, unusual and, uh, and create an incredible opportunity for me to be client facing from day one. Part of it was of course, out of necessity. I was there, I was there with him in New York. So, uh, you know, you never want to go to a meeting by yourself anyway. So I had a lot of exposure to our clients from the very beginning. Um, but part of it also was because uh, he and I developed a strong rapport and a, and a sense of trust and that he knew that when I would be with a client, or, you know, and it's not just him, obviously there's a number of partners um, that, that I, that I was capable and, and good at telling the story to the, to our potential clients uh, as well. Now, Bjorka has has had incredible success, and as as architects go, let's face it, he's he's still fairly young. Yes. As as architects go, I mean, architects hitting their stride really in their fifties and their sixties. What would you say has been, from the inside knowledge you have of working at the firm, has really been the secret sauce that's allowed him to do almost what's been unprecedented in architecture firms at this time? I think it's a couple things. I think it's, uh, I mean, a sh- there is a very strong intellect there um and a uh like a, a not just uh, not just in him but that's something that's kind of built into the team as well so it, it's something that's, that they look for when they hire um people who are curious who are willing to try new things um 
and that he has that and he looks for that uh, in the team. I think also his willingness to delegate is pretty unusual. I, I feel like I see a lot of people who found their own practice who, you know, it's their baby and it's understandable, but they hold on very, very tight to certain aspects of the business. Um, sometimes things that they're good at, sometimes things that they're not good at, but they're just kind of unwilling to let it go and, uh, and to trust someone else to do it. And Bjarka has always trusted, um, to, uh, had trusted kind of the team that, uh, of people around him. Um, so I think those two, those are two things that have, that set him apart. Um, I'm sure other things will come up as I think of it. What would, I think those what are two would really be the key to, to the key to delegating. And obviously whenever you delegate, there's always the chance that something will go wrong. They won't do it the way you want. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing was that he realized what he wanted to be doing and what he didn't want to be doing. So, you know, pretty early on, he brought in, um, uh, a wonderful, brilliant woman, Sheila Sugard, who came in originally as the CFO and has become the, the CEO. Um, I think she started in 2007. And she's someone who's not an architect, um, uh, comes from a finance and consulting, management consulting background. And, you know, I think Bjarka understood what he, what he wanted to be doing and what he didn't want to be doing. What he wanted to be doing was designing the projects and, uh, and he wanted to be doing business development, but he he wanted someone else to oversee him, the building of the infrastructure of the business. And so, uh, so Sheila has really done a remarkable job with that. Uh, and then also the other person who, in my experience of working there has, is, is quite remarkable is Kai Bergman, who's the partner in charge of business development. He's trained as an architect, uh, but kind of this creation of a business development team that, uh, kind of removing some, uh, a good chunk of this, burden quote unquote of the of the sewer, uh, sewer the doer seller model um allowed uh allowed a lot of the teams to do what they what they do best to let the design teams be design teams i will say part like thinking back on this or reflecting back on this because the doer seller model is so strong in the u.s i think one one reason why big was able to do this is because as a european firm especially a young firm, a lot of the work, a lot of the way that you break in there is through um, thoughtful design competitions paid, usually design competitions. And there's a real, um, there's a real tradition of that. So as a young firm, you have this, op- you have these kind of opportunities to break in. And particularly in Denmark, you have a, a country that's been, that's been relatively supportive of young architecture firms and creating this, um, these ways that young architects can get projects. So, um, having a business development team that's actually pulled a little bit separate. So you can kind of, you run really thoughtful competition teams who know how to like win a competition. And then you have a business development team that knows how to get you into that competition that can work. Um, it's, a, it's a different model in the U S it doesn't, it, it, you can't have quite those distinctions. Um, but I, I do think exploring this idea of having a separate business development team has, um, I mean, I got, I was leading one. I got to see just how, how well that worked. Um, but I also know kind of how rare a model that is in the U S. So I want to go back to building the network and the relationship. So as you're, if we can get into the tactics a a little bit, so what, what was the process to cultivate these relationships? So again, you, you've done the research, you've identified the clients, there may be some introductions that happen, but what, what would be the specific process that you would take to get notice and get introduced to these clients or partners or consultants? So a lot of it was kind of a good chunk of it was trying to use the, the relationships we already had. So if there, if we could think about like who, who do our existing clients know in this, in Vancouver or in Seattle or in Chicago, uh, uh, you know, could we, could we get an introduction? But actually I'm in hindsight, we did, I did a shockingly large amount of cold calling which mm. I would not do again, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend to my clients to do. Um, but I did a lot of it. Uh, I think at the, you know, it, it, a lot of it then was like thinking really carefully about what is it in our portfolio that I think this client will be interested in. And that actually, that's really fun uh, to that sort of strategic thinking. Like this is the type of work that they do. This is what they've done in the past. This is what I know about them. You know, they, they, hate green. So don't show them anything green. I don't know. I'm not anything that dramatic or silly, but, uh, 
but really sort of using our portfolio, not just built work, but including unbuilt work to tell a story that I think that this potential client would be interested in. Uh, and there was a lot of that in the beginning. And then I would say that about two years, about two years in, so about 2012, it was, I remember this very distinct conversation. I had, I was calling the university architect of OSU, uh, this really wonderful man who's retired now. And I just, I, you know, I had heard that there's some upcoming work there. So I, I was going to give him a call and I said, I'm calling from big Bjarke Engels group. And I was about to like launch into the spiel that I would give people when they hadn't heard of us. And he, and he said, Oh yeah, I've heard of you. I, I just saw a piece about you in architectural record. I was like, Oh, like, like that's nice. It makes yeah, my job a little easier. It makes my job easier, but also I don't know. Now what do I say now that he's heard of us? Like I, I remember it actually kind of set me back a little bit and I think I hopefully recovered pretty quickly, but it, it was the first time that, that I didn't have to explain everything about who we were. So it's really important to have business development and communications work hand in glove. You want to have, uh, you, you want to have the world be hearing about you through, through the press as well. And so at that point we were starting to get, um, not only industry, I was doing pretty extensive industry coverage, but also um, coverage in in um, non-industry uh, press like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and, and New York Magazine. So that that also really helped, frankly, to um, to legitimize who we were because again, we were still new, and at that point, we still didn't have anything built in the U.S. Um, but people were reading about us and seeing that we were an interesting firm. If you want, if you had a project that needed a different kind of solution, that we were the type of firm that you should come to. Even you, you had the amazing story. And I love that the story when you, you called OSU and for the first time someone said, Oh, we've heard of you. And you're sort of taken yeah. aback, ready to launch into your, your typical explanation. What, what was the explanation that you would give? Can you role play that with me or tell me what that would be if you're calling a, a, a cold contact for the first time? Yeah. Oh, see. So, you know, it was interesting. Uh, you know, one thing that was always important to talk about was that we were a Danish firm, but we were here in New York. Uh, Danish firms have strong, you know, there's a strong design legacy in, in, in Denmark. Uh, you know, we could always talk about uh, approaches to sustainability uh, as something that would you know, often be a hook. Um, uh, but really, I think. So, what, did, did you? I'm curious. Did you tailor this to the individual client, or was it pretty, pretty standard? And I tailor. I mean, I I had like actually, I had a uh, a shoot. What do they call now? Um, I had like a set bit of text that I had in Outlook. I can't remember what the term is for this, but a I a script, a little script that I would just copy and paste, and I would basically tweak the projects I referenced um, to make the projects more specific to that client. Um, and then if there was some more kind of more personal storytelling that or about, you know, is there something we knew in common or something a little bit more personal, I would do that. But we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to template a lot of things so that your energy would be spent on really thoughtfully tailoring the 20% that you need to tailor, but you know that the 80% is just there. And so there was always a lot of thought about um, keeping our keeping really robust templates, and I know that that sounds really mundane. And uh, uh, like anyone who's not in business development would be like, "That's that sounds boring." But I'm like, oh, "We had the best templates. Like we we really had um, strong series of materials." And I was just I was just chatting with my colleague, who's still there, who's the director of Europe, Middle East, and Asia, and she was saying how. In her template, there's like six or seven language layers because we're constantly pursuing work in other languages too. Not so much in the U.S., but certainly from the Copenhagen office. So, uh, you know, having spending a lot of time making sure that that we could quickly customize something for someone was important to us, um, uh, and having those those tools at our fingertips was really important. So, uh, I mean, incredible experience working at big and, and obviously work before that. And even obviously what you're doing now as a strategic consultant and working with firms around the world. I, I'm curious in, in the business development activities that you did do. So you had, you had your picture explanation uh, that you gave them. You mentioned that you would not, you would not have done the cold calling again. <laughs> what would not you recommend? The, not the volume. Okay. Yeah, what would you I, recommend instead? 
I, so I've been talking with a colleague about this. Actually, I have a Kravitz who you've had on the podcast before. She and I were talking about cold calling and we've decided that we don't want, I, I don't want to encourage my, my clients to cold call. I want to encourage them to warm call. I want them, uh, I want them to have an understanding of who it is that's on the other side of the phone and what it is that that person or that company cares about. And even better if you can have some path between you and them. Is there someone who can actually make the introduction for you? People respond so much faster to a personal introduction than they do to an email from someone they've never even heard of before, never, never talked to. Um, so really thinking about understanding your network and your network will actually reveal a lot more opportunities than, than, than most people think it will. So, um, you know, spending time investing in those relationships so that when you can ask people for introductions so that it's just an easy thing for people to do, um, uh, is, will make, will make it the, the process of warm calling, uh, you know, a hundred times easier. Um, but then also thinking about like with the person on the other side of the line, on the other, on the other end of the phone or the zoom call, um, is a human who doesn't want to just hear you talk at them, but also really wants you to be curious about what they're doing. So, so I always use those conversations as a, as yes, maybe an opportunity to pitch, but I didn't ever want to open it with a pitch. I wanted to, I wanted to call because I wanted to understand how they engaged architects. So when I was calling the university architect at OSU, I wanted to have an understanding, of, you know, did they ever hire firms that weren't Midwestern? I know that they do, but you know, how, uh, how could we best set ourselves up? You know, is it recommended that we always go in with a, with a, you know, a Columbus based architect of record do, you know, who are some of the engineers that they, that have done a lot of work with them? Like wh whatever he would tell me is information that I wanted to have. And I, and I, this is something that I say to my clients a lot now, like that, that if you go in just with the mindset of pitching, not only do you, I mean, can you kind of work yourself into a frenzy, but you're also going to turn your own ears off. And, and it's not just about selling them hard on the work that you do, but showing them that, that you understand that they're a human being who has their own needs and desires and thoughts that day and wants to be treated with respect. So going into cold calling from that point of view is, I think is far more effective than just got to just pick up the phone and tell everyone my story like that. You, I just don't think you're going to get very far with that. Even as, as I mentioned earlier, we're recording this during COVID-19, a lot of things very strange happening that we're not used to. Yeah. Uh, concerning anything that I've talked about or we've discussed during this particular episode or anything else is what, what question haven't I asked you that you think <laughs> I should have? Well, I mean, one thing that just kind of comes up when, when asked about cold calling, I feel like a lot of clients and friends are asking me now, like how you know, is it, is it impossible to make new relationships right now? You know, is it, and, and I say to them, like, it's not impossible, but it's hard um, because your clients are also busy. They're all, just as you're dealing with, how, you know, you're thinking about how to keep your business afloat. They're also thinking about how to keep their business or their institution afloat. Um, so people don't have a lot of bandwidth. Um, they're also, some people have more time, but most people don't. Um, so, it doesn't mean that like, well, that's the end of business development, but I think spending the time to really understand who is in your network, who do you actually already have some kind of a relationship with and how can you build on those relationships rather than just randomly starting to reach out to people in that kind of panic, panic mode. Uh, I think that's, I think that's really important to be thinking about in these times right now is to, this is a time to actually stop, take a really deep breath, probably take like eight more deep breaths and then think about how to be strategic so that you're not doing business development in a, in a, in a state of panic because it's, it's, it's a lot of energy and it's probably not going to be very successful, unfortunately. Even where can people go to find out more about you, connect with you and <laughs> discover more about what you're up to? Yeah, of course. Um, so I am like the cobbler's children who have no shoes. I uh, keep meaning to put a website up, uh, and I haven't. Um, but um, people can reach me at eben.falconer at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a very um, unusual name. So anything you Google, unfortunately or fortunately, that will, that will be me. I'm not too hard to find. <laughs> 
Eben Falconer, thank you so much for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Thanks for having me, Nick. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.